For me, one of the greatest joys of gardening is being able to reap all the benefits of my hard work. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Join me next as we take a look at some of the best reasons to get your hands in the soil. I'm Alan Smith. What could be better than going out into your own garden each day and cutting beautiful flowers like these? In today's show, I thought we'd take a look at how to create some spectacular arrangements using some of my favorite garden blooms, such as dahlias, goldenrod, asters, and purple cone flowers, just to name a few. Plus, we'll take a look at a flower in the Narcissus family called the paper white. These little guys can really add a splash of color to your home, especially during the holidays. We'll also visit with a woman who's transformed her small garden into a blooming masterpiece. And in my garden, I wanna share with you one of my favorite everlasting flowers, the straw flower. These little guys will hang around forever. And when we step into the kitchen, I wanna share with you a delicious recipe for an apple cranberry tart that takes full advantage of the harvest season. But first, let's take a tour of this beautiful place. We'll meet up with Kathy Henney after the break, so don't go away. Hi, welcome back. I'm Alan Smith. You know, gardening is such a wonderful way to express yourself. No matter how much space you have, you can always create something beautiful. That's exactly what Kathy Henney has done. Now, Kathy's garden is an excellent example of how you can get creative in a small space and work around existing features like trees. Well, Kathy, I can see what the garden has been designed around. It's this beautiful coastal live oak. Yes, we're really lucky to have a lot of uh, oak trees in Carmel. Do you keep the limbs pruned up to create that canopy? Yes. So by pruning it, you uh, create a vista through the windows, and at the same time, you allow more sun into the garden. Mm -hmm. People in our guest room upstairs say it's like waking up in a tree house. I bet. And nothing says a welcome more than a rose over an arbor. That's what we think. What a great gate. Now this section of the garden is, has the pinks and the purples and the white, so it's a little bit more lively, especially with the dahlia. I like the way you've used not only pinks, but you've used pinks that are blue, what I call blue pinks. Yes. And rather than getting into the warmer pinks, which would be an orange, it would have some apricot. Exactly. Yeah. And, and lots of things going on here, hydrangea, dahlia, impatience. I, I like the path. It's, it's very intimate. It brings you right up to the front. Yeah, it's kind of meandering, so you can take your time. Right. Go sit on the bench if you want to. A landscape painter told me once, in nature there are no straight lines. Yes. And uh, I think that that's a good lesson to remember. I really like the way you've used the same materials in the path that you used over here in the patio and with this wonderful wall that creates this enclave. The circular feeling is supposed to make you want to walk out of the house and draw you into the, onto the patio. Well, I think it works. And for a tiny little yard, it, it, uh, I think it makes it look a lot bigger. Big ideas for a small space. Right. You know, there's nothing any more soothing than the sound of water. I agree. Yeah, this must be a real pleasure to come out here and just sit and listen to it. Couldn't envision this space without a, a little fountain of some sort. Yeah, and they've just they've become so affordable now. It's the sort of thing anybody can add to their to their garden. Kathy, thank you so much for taking the time to show me this beautiful garden. I mean, you've proven that you can take a small space and do some spectacular things. Well, thank you for coming. It's been a pleasure for me. To me, one of the greatest aspects of growing gorgeous flowers in the garden is that many of them can be brought inside and used as cut flowers. They can really add a refreshing touch to your home. I've discovered that an arrangement like this is the simplest and quickest to put together. 
I just take various bundles of flowers and drop them into a single container. Now you don't have to grow your own flowers to enjoy them this way. They're plentiful in florist and farmers markets during the summer. With so many blooms out there to choose from, it's easy to get carried away, particularly if you're trying to put together a small arrangement. That's why I've always found it helpful to have a simple basic strategy to follow in the beginning. I start by taking a piece of floral foam that I've soaked in water and I place it in a plastic liner and then secure it with some floral tape. At this point I have a lot of flexibility because I can slip this liner into a variety of containers. I'm going to use this little terracotta one. Now the first thing I want to do is establish the finished form of the arrangement and I'm going to do that by using some of these tall vertical elements. In this case, I'm using Lyatris. For a bold splash of color, I'm using these Asiatic hybrid lilies. To add a little more visual interest, I'm using one of my all-time favorite perennials, the Native American purple coneflower. And to help soften and fill in, I'm using this lavender aster. I've stayed true to my simple strategy, and for a summer color combination, it's hard to beat clear yellows and lavender. When we come back, I have some flower arranging ideas that will help you create a fantastic fall display. That's all next, so stay with us. Because of the harvest season, the autumn has always been a time of plenty. Plenty of beautiful fruits, vegetables, and of course, flowers. This time of year, there's a wide range of blooms available to us. Blooms that reflect the season, such as asters, dahlias, and even goldenrod. I always enjoy putting together some of these autumn plants for a simple centerpiece. For this arrangement, I'm using just a shallow dish as the container and a block of florist foam as a base to hold the flowers. Now since this centerpiece will be long and narrow, I'll use some of this brightly colored liatris to establish its length. And to define its height, I'll use this bittersweet. I like to make table arrangements low enough to be able to see and visit those seated across from me. Now that the size is established, I'll use some of these festive dahlias for a bold splash of color, and I'll fill in with asters and goldenrod. Many believe that this American wildflower, goldenrod, actually causes hay fever, but it doesn't. You see, ragweed is the real culprit. Both plants bloom at the same time of year, but since goldenrod has such a showy flower, it usually gets the blame. So hopefully, you won't avoid using it in your floral arrangements. This time of year, there's so many interesting and beautiful gifts from the garden for floral arrangements. The main thing to remember is to use your imagination and just have some fun. And if you love the look and fresh aroma of daffodils and you want them around throughout the fall and winter seasons, don't worry, there's one you should consider. This is the paper white narcissus. It's actually a form of daffodil, so to speak, and it's a bulb that will produce a living bouquet for your home. It's all right here in this little brown wrapper, a total package from nature. You see the flower, stem, and leaves are already formed, and all it takes is time and a little water to coax it out. I try to plant paper whites at two-week intervals throughout the fall, so I can have containers of them blooming constantly. I also buy extra bulbs so I can have them blooming after the holidays. I just store them in my refrigerator until I'm ready to plant them. These bulbs will grow in anything. Nutrient really isn't an issue when it comes to forcing them to flower. They'll grow in sand or gravel or for that matter, just plain water. But I prefer to use a basic potting soil. I pack as many bulbs as I can into a container and the soil will help anchor them. It'll also serve as a medium for sowing ryegrass seed around them. The grass will provide a nice texture, and the bright fresh green is always a welcome sight during the winter. Now with just a little water, this grass will germinate within a week, and the paper whites can be blooming within four weeks. If I want to accelerate that, all I have to do is put them in a warmer room with brighter light. Water is critical. You want to keep the soil saturated around the bulbs, because if they get too dry, it can keep them from flowering. Now let's step into my garden. I can't wait to show you what's new. That's next, so don't go away. 
Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome back. In today's show, we're taking a look at how to grow and use flowers in the garden. A little earlier, we created a beautiful seasonal display using a simple color palette of yellows and lavenders. We also put to rest a common myth about a fall blooming favorite, goldenrod. No, this plant doesn't cause hay fever. It's actually ragweed that's the culprit. If you haven't tried growing one of the wonderful cultivars of goldenrod in your garden, you're really missing out. One of my favorites is this one called Fireworks. Isn't it spectacular? Now some of the flowers in my garden will actually persist through other seasons by drying them. Some of my favorites are hydrangeas, artemisias, and sunflowers. You see, these dried plants are often called everlasting because they'll last for years to come. As everlastings go, the straw flower has to be the all-time classic. All you have to do is touch one of these petals to understand how it takes its name. Even before the buds open into flowers, the petals are already dry and crispy, like straw. For most of us, this plant has grown as an annual. You can either plant more mature plants like this directly in the ground, or you can sow it from seed in the spring as soon as the soil begins to warm. I dry straw flowers just as I do many other everlastings. After I cut them, I remove any excessive foliage and then I bind them with a rubber band and hang them in a cool, dry place. If you're into dried flowers, you know that the bright colors of straw flowers will last for a long time, and they can give your flower arrangements that extra sparkle. I'm always on the lookout for new plants for my garden, so I was pleasantly surprised to find a new series of Bracteantha. Now, Bracteantha is just a fancy name for straw flowers. These were on display at a marketplace for new plant introductions. I had a chance to speak with the plant breeder, Roger Elliott. He's from Australia, and he's developed the Wallaby series of Branctiantha for the flower fields. Well, what I love about the Wallaby series in particular is this variety called Flame. Flame? Gosh, okay. talk about warming up the fall garden. That's right, and they really are an excellent fall product. And you'll probably find that the flower is even a, a deeper color in the fall than in the the spring. Really? Yeah. Sometimes people think because they've got that, you know, dry flower, they right. need dry conditions, and that's not so. They like moist, not wet, but moist, Just well con drained. Consistent, consistent moisture. moisture. What about feeding to get a beautiful flower set like yeah. that? Yeah, they don't want too much feed, mainly because Australia's soils are very poor. Okay. <laughs> and sometimes we're too kind and that can be a bit deadly. I see, so and you can't nurse them along and fuss over them too much no. because they'll produce probably, I guess, more foliage that, than bloom. That's right, so on the slightly hungry side. Well, you know, you said something interesting there. Uh, you said that the soil in Australia is poor and that gives you a clue as to how to feed and take care of this plant. Mm -hmm. And I think it's so often it is helpful to know the origin of plants so that you can know how to care for them. I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. Even Australia, there's lots of desert, but we have rainforest, we have alpine areas too. Richly diverse, just yeah, as this country that's is. That's right. Well, this is an outstanding series. How long has it been in this country? This has just, just arrived. Well, it's been trialled here for maybe nearly two years. Especially University of Georgia went through the heat trial. Ah, okay, so it is very heat tolerant. They gave it top marks and it's the best Bractantha they've ever had in their trials. Look forward to seeing it in American gardens. So do we. Another great flower you should consider for growing and cutting is the dahlia. They can range in height from dwarf, about 15 inches tall, like these Dalietta and Dallanova, or this one called Long Life but they can grow as large as giants, which grow to about six feet or more. One of the things I like about dahlias is they're not fussy about soil. Any average garden soil will do. When you fertilize, you wanna make sure you don't give them too much nitrogen. You see, this will cause them to produce fewer blooms and soft, weak stems. If you live in a part of the country where cold winters and hard frosts are the rule, it's important to lift dahlia tubers or the roots from the ground and store them. I like to dig them at least with a one foot diameter root ball, lift soil and all and put them in a cool, dark, dry place, and then cover them with dry sand or sawdust until I'm ready to replant them in the spring. In mild climates, dahlias are regarded as perennials and can be left in the ground through the winter by simply mulching the plants after you've cut them back in the fall. The way I see it, these flowers are worth any extra trouble you may have to go through to keep them from one year to the next. 
And another great thing about dahlias, they make good long-lasting cut flowers. And as you can imagine, with this kind of color, they can make a bold splash in the garden. How about a delicious recipe that makes the perfect cool season dessert? That's after the break, so stay with us. I really enjoy the simple classic desserts and especially those that are made from fruit that's fresh and in season like these Granny Smith apples. So I'm making a French apple tart. It's a time-honored French dessert and I'm adding a few cranberries for a new twist on this old favorite. This recipe takes six large cooking apples that have been peeled, cored, and quartered lengthwise. Now I'll melt one stick of unsalted butter in a large iron skillet with one cup of sugar. Then arrange the apples in a ring around the pan with the edges turned down and cook them on the burner at a very high heat for 10 to 12 minutes. Checking them often to make sure they're not burning on the bottom. By then the juices should be a rich golden brown. I'll remove this from the heat and turn each slice over and cook the apples another five minutes, again on a high heat. Now I'll sprinkle a cup of fresh cranberries over the top and cover it with a thick pastry crust. I found that doubling up pre-made pastry crust works really well. Now you'll want to let the pan cool for a while before you tuck the edges of the crust around the sides. Bake this for about 35 minutes in a preheated 375 degree oven until the crust is golden brown. When it has cooled for about 10 minutes, cut around the perimeter with a knife and flip the tart over onto a serving plate. Now you may have to rearrange some of the fruit. Just look at this beautiful and tasty dessert. It's out of this world served with fresh whipped cream and a good cup of coffee. Well, that's it for today's show. I've certainly enjoyed our time together. And I hope you've found a few things that'll help inspire you to bring more beauty into your garden. Like planting some of these dahlias. Aren't they spectacular and so easy to grow? Now, all the information in today's show can be found on my website. That's pallensmith.com. That includes that wonderful recipe for an apple tart. Make sure you try it. Until next time, from the garden, I'm Alan Smith. In this garden I dream of a bed of flowers, bluebirds sing of the beauty all around us and every time the sun comes out i can't help but smile oh no i can't help but smile